Hi, Chris. It's Mom. Look, honey, I've got a lot of work to do, so I won't be home until late again. Just do the usual, you know, fix yourself a little something, anything you want. Oh, and I left some money for you on the counter. Use it for whatever you like. Now, Dad won't be home until Tuesday. He says hi. Oh, and somebody told me you quit soccer. Is anything wrong? Well, just leave me a note. I love you. Bye. Been. After an historic three-peat, the air was let out of Chicago. When I lose uh, the sense of motivation and the sense of to prove something as a basketball player, uh, it's time for me to move away from the game of basketball. There was a super comeback, a Super Bowl, and Super Mario beating the league and the odds. The Canadiens beat everybody. America's national pastime endured with another fall classic both south and north of the border. We witnessed the departure of one bird and the miracle comeback of another. There'll be long distance connections, intimate conversations, and even a communication breakdown. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, we want this show to be important to you. It means a lot to me. Maybe it doesn't mean a lot to me. Our insightful team of Sports Center reporters will provide thought and reflection as we take a look back at the year of 1993. Sports Center, everyone. I'm Robin Roberts. 1993 was no ordinary year in sports, and this show promises to be no ordinary year in review. Over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, myself, along with my Sports Center colleagues, will bring to you a unique perspective of this past year. We'll show you what happened, the way it happened, on ESPN's Sports Center. There were hirings and firings, trades and transitions, milestones and mayhem on and off the courts and fields. But nowhere was the drama of sport unfolding more swiftly than in the Windy City itself. If the Bulls repeating was considered the high of the sports year, then the surprise announcement of their favorite guard was no doubt the low. So let's begin our journey with the big story of 1993. got to the pinnacle of my career, I achieved practically everything I could from an individual standpoint and from a team standpoint. And it really made it, made it easy to walk away while you was on top. Of course, a big story. The air has been let out of the basketball. Yeah, and by the guy who defies gravity. Today in Chicago, Michael Jordan defying every conventional wisdom. He has nothing left to prove, no one more to impress. Michael Jordan this morning, you heard him say he won't miss the cheers. He doesn't need them to live is not needed to survive. The seven-time NBA scoring champion announced his retirement. Michael Jordan marched into the Bulls practice facility Wednesday morning to announce his retirement, and the ensuing processional was a veritable who's who in the NBA. Teammates flanked him, and coaches stood by, along with hundreds of assembled media with one collective question, why? But I've always stressed to people that have known me and the media that has followed me that when I lose uh, the sense of motivation and the sense of to prove something as a basketball player, uh, it's time for me to move away from the game of basketball. I'd say when I walk away from the game, I won't miss the cheers because it was there. It was there. I can remember those things, but I don't need it to live. I don't need it to survive.
not since the spring of 1964, when the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Boston Celtics finished a three-year span in which they each three-peated, has the double-triple been accomplished in hoops and hockey. The New York Times reported this morning that Jordan was seen playing blackjack at 2.30 early Tuesday morning. It was that story first and then the Bulls quest second. I was not out until 2.30, 1.30, or 2 o'clock. I was in my bed. I got eight hours of sleep, got up at 9 o'clock, went to practice at 9.45, and that was eight hours. Now, if you want to take that out of context, that's for me. The gambling did exceed, in terms of coverage, the games themselves. So, in the closing seconds of regulation, Charles, a chance to win it, can't get it done. Two sons fight for it, Ainge for the win, but it rims out. We go to a second overtime, tied at 107. Marley, the big shot right there, ties it. We go to a third overtime. Awful pass in Barkley for the steal and the layup. The Suns crawling all over the floor with exhaustion and exuberance. 129, 121 in three overtimes. Yeah, Michael Jordan shot the ball 43 times. Damn. That's unbelievable. He's gonna be icing his elbow too. Michael's doing what he has to do. He's busting to the basket when he needs to. He'd like to involve his teammates. They are not stepping up. They're kind of stepping back, playing tentatively. Do you like the Suns' chances? I, unless the Bulls come out aggressively, Dan, Suns will win this game. Suns survive 108 98. That's it, baby. I believe. You talked to God? I talked to God the other day. What did he say? Saying, uh, he said, hang in there, Chuck. When you're down 3-1, but all you got to do is win. You know, people say you're one game from elimination. He says you're three games away from the world championship. 40 seconds to go, though. No defense for this. They just part Michael with a vintage drive, pulls the Bulls back within two to Grant, to an open Paxson. The legacy of his career may be clinching shots. We're not supposed to root. The embrace between Jordan and Barkley, but I like rooting for history. An historical three-peat for Chicago, the first team in 27 years to win three straight titles. Destiny shall be back here for the fourth time. Thank you. The Pittsburgh Penguins were going to lose a game. To see their arch rivals, the New York Islanders, come off and be the Cinderella team. A minute left, Larry Murphy shot, tipped by Francis, then by Rick Tockett. We're tied at three. We're going to OT. And in overtime, Mario Lemieux, same story, stoned by Glenn Healy. The Islanders take advantage of their good goaltending. Ferraro finding Volica one time to then scores the game winner for the New York Islanders. They do it. They pull off the upset. For Mario, though, and the Penguins, no three-peat this year. Pat Conacher puts a rebound past Wah, and the Kings lead it 2-1. to one. Pat Conacher, journeyman. Then the turning point. Kerry Frazier said that Marty McSorley was using an illegally curved stick. McSorley goes to the penalty box. Desjardins from the slap. And it's all over. Desjardins with a hat trick, a defenseman with a hat trick. I think there's a lot of players on both teams that, are, that have sticks that are, that are close. Um, I never thought it was over. Three straight overtime wins leading Montreal to tonight. 3-1 halves into the third. Di Pietro and Gilbert on two on one. Di Pietro goes shelf the picture of the champions in the sport for 19 and 93, the Montreal Canadiens. Temperatures in the mid 40s for game six of the ALCS. In the postseason, Dave Stewart has avoided the sting of the cold and of losing. They were wearing double layers in Chicago. Alex Fernandez, a Miami native, says he doesn't mind the cold temperatures. He does mind this. Top of second, no score, and they're loaded. Pat Borders to right. Burks cannot get to it. Olerud and Molitor scored 2 0 Jays. Bottom ninth, two out, 6 3. Wayne Ward facing Tim Raines for the ALCS. Ward comes set. The pitch. A swing and a fly ball to right field. This is going to do it. Joe Carter's under it. He's got it, and the Blue Jays are going back to the World Series. This is what it's all about. You know, you work hard for to get to this position, and, you know, when you win it, it just feels fantastic. When, you, when it's been this far in between appearances, uh, it's something that you savor. How could a team that won 104 regular season games be treated so rudely? That's what the Braves were asking when they went to Veterans Stadium tonight. Bottom of the third. Maddox walks Green to lead off the inning, then loads the bases. Darren Dalton, who was hitting just 200 in the series, rips one, and it's going to be just fair down the line. So it scores Green and Dykstra, and the Phils have a 2 to nothing lead over Maddox and the Braves. It was 6-3 with two out in the ninth. Mitch Williams coming on to finish it off for the Phils. 
Mitch Williams, one, two, three in the ninth. What are you kidding me? Well, I was just kind of teasing all year. I was saving that for last. And I was just a surprise to everybody else, but I, I couldn't be happier. It is without a doubt the most exciting moment in all of sports. A game winning, World Series winning home run in the bottom of the ninth inning. Well, the 1993 Major League Baseball season is now history, and with it goes another piece of history. Add Joe Carter to the gentleman behind us. We go bottom of nine. Mitch Williams is in for Anderson. First batter he faces, Ricky Henderson, walks him on four pitches. Two batters later, Molitor singles the center. Runners on first and second. Kurt Schilling can't bear to watch Mitch Williams facing Joe Carter. Wild thing. Shakes it off, inside fastball, Carter turns on it. Yes, yes, you betcha. Three run shot. Jays win 8 6 at the bottom of the ninth. They celebrate. Wild Thing leaves the field. Joe Carter said that tomorrow he planned to watch football. Tomorrow, I think Joe Carter will be watching <laughs> some football. I would assume that this is the biggest thrill you've ever had in your baseball life. I tell you what, words got to describe uh, what went through my mind that ninth inning. And to see the ball, I mean, with two strikes, to hit the ball at the ballpark, this is, this is something you, you dream about in your backyard when you're a little kid, and now I can, I can be a little kid. In a game with so many big plays. Right away, Tommy, Aikman, Irvin, look at the move he makes on Williams, the touchdown, and a 14-10 lead at the end of the half is now 28 to 10. Hex it up, rumbling, bumbling, stumbling, he goes all the way. 52 to 10. This will probably be the one play that's remembered from the Super Bowl. Leon Lett, and he just could go all the way. I know, Don Beebe, at least trying, knocks the ball out of the end zone. I think it's what all of us who cover college football have waited for it for a long time, a true national championship game, one versus two. Could Alabama and Miami possibly live up to this kind of billing? That's the kind of pressure that was on Gene Stallings looking for a national championship against Dennis Erickson. Third and nine, the Heisman Trophy winner, Gino Toretta, picked off by Sam Shade. Gino Toretta trying to rally the Canes, picked off again in the second half. Now you're thinking about this comeback that's going to happen. Gino trying to find that Heisman form. Instead, he kept finding tied defenders. Gene Stallings, who didn't start off well at Alabama, but has now given them a national championship, just like the old Bear days. I'll remind you again that the crystal football is valued at $35,000. <laughs> Dale Brown said of the Bears, they don't have a prayer against Duke. Well, I guess the Cal team found a Saturday afternoon church service to their liking. Mm -hmm. That game was similar to the uh, Sugar Bowl. Blowing a lead and still coming back to beat the champs, that made it a memorable game. Look Jason Kidd picks up the loose ball and goes off the glass with about a minute to go, gets it and is fouled. Now only 25 seconds to go, Duke tries to tie. Hurley, can he do it? No, off the back iron. Murray would hit the free throw to ice the game. The celebration begins. He's not in pain, he's happy. Coach K. And Jason Kidd embracing after a great college basketball game. Cal wins it by five. And then the emotion after it was amazing to watch Mike Krzyzewski. Every time that we went out on the court, I knew that they would give me their bodies, their minds, and their hearts. Uh, I'm always sad that I can't do it anymore with them. Uh, and all this stuff where people talk about college sports and things being bad, you have no, I want to whack everybody who says that. College sports are great. The Chris Webber mistake was a little bit, weird. But it, that, that wasn't funny. The alley-oop to Chris Webber, remember that name. Michigan retakes the lead, but the Tar Heels stay in it. Donald Williams again pulling up for three on the break. The game tied at 58. Under a minute to go. Weber with the rebound. Now watch him. Watch him. Clock running down. He travels there. It wasn't called. So he says, hey, I got away with that one. I'll go into the fourth court. And then I'll call timeout to set things up. Only one problem. They didn't have any timeouts left. Technical foul in possession to Carolina. The Tar Heels go on to win the national championship. 77 to 71. I really don't have any excuses. Uh, 
I just called a timeout and I shouldn't have. It's true that for every winner, there's a loser. For every victory, a defeat. And for every aspiring player, a retiring coach. There were hirings and firings, comings and goings, transitions of all sorts. Joe Montana left his heart on the West Coast only to move inland. Mike Ditka sadly saw his windy city become just a little bit colder. And the word courage took on a new definition in the name of Dennis Bird and Mario Lemieux. Mario Lemieux of the Pittsburgh Penguins has been diagnosed tonight with Hodgkin's disease. On the way down to my house, uh, could hardly drive because of, uh, of the tears and, and crying all day. And that was certainly a tough day in my life. As soon as I'm 100%, uh, I'll be back, and hopefully I'll be back for the playoffs and um, you know, win another Stanley Cup. It's rare to link the words hope and cancer in the same phrase, and Lemieux did it. And he did it beautifully on ice, too. You know, every time you're out for two months or a long period of time, uh, you don't know what to expect. Around to the near side of Mario Lemieux, trying to shoot it back in front. Talk it's up in it by Galley. Play continues back to Lemieux. Lemieux comes in, shoots and scores! Mario Lemieux drills it in, his 40th of the year. On the same night that Mario Lemieux was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, Dennis Bird was able to speak about his recovery from a spinal injury. This has been the hardest time of my life. Yeah, I can move it. I can, I can pick it up and <laughs> kick it a little bit. And do all kinds of stuff, you know. I can sit here and tap dance for you, but I don't want this to be a, <laughs> you know, I didn't want this to be a circus show. I'm very glad, very proud to be standing before you here today. And quite frankly, I'm glad to be standing anywhere today. In the, Obviously, that was written down. <laughs> George came back <clears throat> clearly wanting to be liked. The Yankees handed out 300 credential stickers. Paparazzi, fans, flighty well-wishers, Hooters girls, and even security awaited the return of the boss. <laughs> Just when you thought Warren Moon couldn't top the heartbreak from last year's playoff loss in Denver, along comes a banged-up, bummed-out Bills team led by a backup quarterback. Biggest oil spill since the Exxon Valdez. Bubba McDowell takes the tip off Keith McKellar's hands, and it's 35-3 Houston. He could go, you know. Forget it. Forget it. This is where the Bills go out a little early this year. It's 38 all. Bills can win it here. Wright puts it down. The kick is on the way, and it is good! And the Bills have won it! The Bills have won it! The Euler defense apparently left for Miami at halftime, a little prematurely. It was as simple as that. We choked. We choked as a team. We choked as management. Everyone in this organization was choked. A word that has surfaced repeatedly in our nation's capital recently now applies to the Washington Redskins. Transition. I have uh, one son that's playing, uh, playing on the West Coast. Uh, played at Stanford. Uh, I've seen him play two games, and uh, that bothers me. I want to go and uh, see him play. I want to sit in the stands and just be a dad. Joe Gibbs, his football legacy, three different quarterbacks, three Super Bowl championships, one coach, one philosophy. The genius is in the details. Larry's legend once over lightly. Larry Bird said that there will be another Larry Bird one day. And Larry, there will never, ever, ever be another Larry Bird. Tonight, my basketball career is officially over. And I had a blast. One of the things you could rely on every year of your life, April 15th, you pay your taxes. May 30th or 31st, A.J. Foyt's in the Indy 500. Well, I'm still paying taxes. The eight-year-old Foyt, who hadn't driven in a race since last year's Indy, took one last lap at the old brickyard and then announced he was retiring from racing. You gotta win. The bottom line is you have to win. Nine days after the completion of his worst season ever, Mike Ditka was fired. <sighs> it's 
scripture tells you that all things shall pass. This too shall pass. I guess you gotta thank the players most, because they make it happen. I was blessed. I came here and I inherited a hell of a football team. But that moment with those guys outside, yelling for Ditka to come out, the coach of the Bears, I think encapsulated in a couple of seconds what that guy meant to, uh, to all the guys in the saloons of Chicago. Parcells was picked over Mike Ditka and Buddy Ryan to pick up the pieces of the pitiful Patriots. Anyone that has their own agenda that's separate and or distinct from the team won't be around too long. Larry Brown, who's never met a job he didn't keep, won't be keeping his with the Clippers. There is a coach named Brown who wanders around town to town. He quits all his jobs to escape basketball mobs. There's no employer he can turn down. Jeff Torborg had seen the green handwriting on the wall early Wednesday morning, and it spelled Dallas. While he slept, his fate in Cincinnati was decided. A phone call from Reds general manager Jim Bowden woke him up in the morning. That's how he was told that he was out and Davey Johnson was in. Meanwhile, Cal's Lou Campanelli is the first major coaching casualty of the college hoop season, a testament to the growing power that players can wield. I want to make it perfectly clear to everyone. I was not fired for any aberrant behavior, immorality. There are no skeletons in the closet, no ongoing NCAA investigation of violations. I did no wrong. I basically created a monster, folks, and the monster came back and bit my head off. I had my doubts. At first, all I heard from were disgruntled former players. He actually tried to give me money one time. But then one of those players handed the phone to a man who would not identify himself only than to say he was an assistant coach who was jeopardizing his career at Houston and his future in coaching by telling the truth about what John Jenkins was doing in the football program. What John Jenkins has asked us to do as coaches here at the University of Houston is to lie. Many have accused John Jenkins of running up the score. Now, Jenkins and his University of Houston football program are being hit by charges much more unsettling. We talked about how to get around getting caught, how to keep from getting caught. We talked about actually breaking the rules. ESPN obtained this document, which states that all 24 players who entered the university in 1987 graduated. I haven't graduated, so I know that's not true, you know? And I know at least five others to, that didn't graduate as well. Four days later, after it was mutually agreed that Jenkins would talk with us, we met him on campus. But Jenkins moved to change the rules. We received a list of accusations by ESPN. Myself or any other member of the university would be not be available for any comment. Jenkins himself recently confirmed that he inserted video clips of bare-breasted women into game films shown to his football team. There was a woman, she was gyrating, doing things with her clothes off. At least three former Houston football players allegedly have received death threats amid the swirl of allegations against Jenkins. And Staggs himself recently received this voicemail message from one of his colleagues. All I want you to know is you are a yellow-backed, spineless human being. I'm going to tell you what, young man, you mess with me and my family when you mess with Coach Jenkins. Any act of intimidation by any member of our coaching staff or administration is uh, reprehensible to me, and uh, it's unacceptable in the Houston Cougar program. University of Houston football coach John Jenkins resigned Friday. That I'll always have that fighting Cougar in my heart. The uh, Patriots select Drew Bledsoe, quarterback, Washington State University. And I'm really excited, uh, especially that uh, we got this all done before training camp, so I don't have to miss any football. Williams, who is now the GM of the Magic, was holding that number one pick once again. Would he hold it? Would he trade it? He actually did a little bit of both. He took Chris Weber as expected. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to report a trade. The Warriors grabbed Hardaway and then packaged his rights along with three future number one picks to Orlando, 
for the rights to Weber. Marcus Allen is leaving L.A. for the arch-rival Kansas City Chiefs. We've gotten another one. Quarterback Boomer is signing by signing free agent outside linebacker Carl Banks. So Wilbur Marshall goes to Houston. Those two stories. So Joe Montana. Reggie White. The most amount of time spent on nothing happening. Reggie White has narrowed his field to a select group of teams the free agent will play for next season, led by the Jets, Packers, and Niners. The Redskins will offer the free agent defensive lineman a three-year, $7.5 million contract. More people attended a rally to urge free agent Reggie White to stay with the Eagles, then went to the rally to celebrate Villanova's NCAA title. Today, Reggie paid a visit to Ohio. Reggie White was at the Knicks game, still left on this travel tour, the Washington Redskins. He was at the Pistons game last week. Reggie was in New York Tuesday. Reggie White has been everywhere. He will thunder across the frozen tundra. Lambeau Field is home to Reggie White now. And just 12 hours after he arrived, Reggie White was in the Packer Hall of Fame as a visitor. I mean, one. <laughs> to make a trade in football seems almost impossible. Joe Montana was in Kansas City today. And he wasn't looking for a good steakhouse. See, Joe Montana spent Friday visiting Phoenix, a day after visiting Kansas City. The other possibilities for Montana are Phoenix and Tampa. The Detroit Lions are interested in Joe Montana. This morning, we continue our Joe Montana watch. Will it be Phoenix or Kansas City, or will he stay in San Francisco? According to ESPN's Chris Mortensen, Joe Montana is about to become a Kansas City Chief. Going through withdrawal because there are no more Reggie White stories, Joe Montana. Joe Montana. Joe Montana. Is the there for you. It may seem like we have overkilled this story, but the emotional commitment between the Niners fans and Joe Montana is stronger than we could describe if we did a Joe Montana story every two minutes. True. We've been doing that. A player as talented as Joe Montana just doesn't get traded that easily, but it is finally done. I have absolutely no regrets whatsoever. <laughs> Plays of the week time. Yes! This week, the plays of the week pays honor to the king, Elvis Presley. You can't step on his blue suede shoes, but you can lick his stamp. The people you won't be seeing this week are selected out of thousands of applicants that are knocked around in the newsroom before we go on the air. And it may be the most fun part of it because we can work in sports history, we can work in terrible, terrible puns. And that's all there is to life. For those of you already employed, you won't be seeing Bill Plummer, Chris Carpenter, or Lawyer Tillman. You won't see Joanne Big Mama Carter, former outfielder Jerry Mumfrey, or legendary NBA coach Dick Mata, but you will see the mother of all plays of the week. Hello. Hi, Mom. We would have called sooner, but you wouldn't believe the day we had. Oh. <laughs> That's very funny. Thank you. <laughs> It's the May Sweeps, and only three things matter. Ratings. Whoa, he broke the window. Ratings. Is that on? Let it. Ratings. <laughs> Once upon a time, in a land far away, make that a land very far away, confusion reign. Now, a loose puck at the Kings line, the Devils steal a shot, score! Cowboys with a basketball. Reeves. I'm going to try the sucker play. There it is. There. 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 No whistle. It worked. It worked. Bernard Flood gets it off. Yeah. It's good. It's good. It's bizarre. Here it is. Two minutes. Boom. And once you're through, you may say, what, wait a minute. What happened? Who? What, what was that? And those are the plays of the week. There were no shortage of milestones in 1993. It was a year of decided contrast. Carlton Fisk caught the star he had long dreamt of, while Anthony Young's inability to win was like a recurring nightmare. 
And while championships were being won on the field, violence raised its ugly hand on the ice and courts. And nowhere was violence more prevalent than in the country of Somalia, where Riddick Bowe witnessed it all firsthand. Jimmy Roberts chronicled the champ's visit. Some of the things that we saw on the trip, you'd have a real problem thinking that he could manufacture these emotions or this type of behavior as a public relations gesture. After all he had been through in barely a week, it was yet another special day. Are you nervous about what you're going to see today? Very much so. I think I'm more nervous than I would be for a fight. And with good cause. Just 10 minutes after he landed, the champ was hit with a roundhouse to the heart. There was a little girl in there that I, you know, uh, touched on the back and gave a little, you know, uh, hug to her. And I felt nothing but bones. And I guess it kind of messed me up. And I think it's very unfair for a person her age to be in that predicament. She didn't ask to come in. The children of this feeding center likely had no idea who their giant visitor was, but the compound's 23-year-old volunteer leader did. Valerie Place said after the visit she would remember it for the rest of her life. Tragically, she didn't have much of a chance. What was a photo opportunity for this day became the real war that it is every day. One hour later, Valerie Place was killed in an ambush on the way to Baidoa. But Bo had no idea. How's everybody doing? By that time, he was already at an army supply unit. His spirits rising, along with those of the troops he had come to visit. There we went to a hospital that was run by AmeriCares, the American Relief Agency, that was so shocking. No septic system, not enough medical supplies. But with the arrival of Big Daddy's airlift, $1.7 million worth of medical supplies has found its way to Mandera. In terms of people living and people dying, will this plane make a difference? Oh, magnificent, yes, major difference. This was a week that Riddick Bowe learned a new way to fight, and in doing so showed that even without a jab or a hook, he is a champion for all of the world. I was walking out to lunch when the bulletin hit the computer. I immediately turned uh, us on and I see Bob Lee Monica Sellis was attacked today, stabbed in the back by a 38-year-old man during a match in Hamburg, Germany. Sunday celebration resulted in random gunfire, 700 arrests, and two deaths. 47 police vehicles were damaged by mobs that roamed St. Catherine Street. And when you're losing a lot, it doesn't take much to lose it completely. I'm sick and tired of all this bullshit. Now, put that in your pipe and smoke. 14 years ago when we signed on, I don't think we really thought that what we would be reporting on a daily basis about sports would be so far removed so often from the final score. The one prevailing memory I have over the first six months is death. But first, there is late and tragic news from college basketball. Chris Street, a 6'8 forward with the 14th ranked Iowa Hawkeyes, was killed in a car accident earlier this evening in Iowa City. Street was returning from a team meal when his car collided with a dump truck. Street was averaging nine rebounds and 13 points in the Hawkeyes' first 15 games this year. The Iowa game with Northwestern, scheduled for Wednesday night, has been postponed. Chris Street was two weeks shy of his 21st birthday. Drazen Petrovic, who with the New Jersey Nets these past two seasons had blossomed into one of the NBA's star young guards and whose intelligence and leadership had won him respect and friendship around the league and around the country, is reported dead tonight at the age of 28, the victim of an automobile accident in Germany. He was riding in the passenger seat of a car that hit a tractor trailer, killing him instantly. Petrovic was returning from Poland where he played for Croatia in a qualifying tournament. The team returned. He left them in Frankfurt to visit his girlfriend. Those who knew him in his game were still painfully stunned. He left no stones unturned in terms of uh, trying to make himself the best player he could be. And uh, as I said, we don't get enough players in this game. <laughs> they care that much about the game. Tonight, we report on the death of stock car racing driver Davey Allison at the age of 32. I remember years ago, Bobby got hurt real bad at Elko, Minnesota. And I never thought I'd see the man hurt that bad again. He almost died. I saw him in intensive care day after day. 
and didn't think he'd make it. And the worst I've ever seen him hurt was Clifford Funeral. And uh, we gotta do it again. I don't know if we can. Hall of Fame catcher Roy Campanella has died from a heart attack. All the baseball world is in mourning. 56-year-old Don Drysdale is dead. Three members of the Cleveland Indians were involved in a one-boat accident at 7.30 this evening, 30 miles west of Orlando. One player is dead. His name has not yet been released. The other two players are listed in critical condition. It's the last thing in your mind ever, and especially at spring training. The three players involved have been confirmed. Pitcher Steve Olin is dead. Tim Cruz in surgery right now. Bobby Ojeda reportedly in satisfactory condition. And Jane Wattrell of WFTV in Orlando joins us now to update the story. Jane. What we are being told by eyewitnesses is that the speedboat struck a dock and then all the ball players, the Cleveland Indian ball players that were aboard, and there were three of them, were hit in the chest. Tim Cruz is in critical condition. He is in surgery right now. It was our feeling when he first arrived that he likely had a non-survivable brain injury. Cruz was pronounced dead at 5.40 a.m. Tuesday morning. We'll get over this. I don't know about the Cruz no. Cruz leaves a wife and three children. He was 31. I'm not dealing with it very well at all. He was out. Uh, not even a baseball related. He was um, my best friend. He was the best man at my wedding. And more, the reason I am where I am today is because of him. The support in Cleveland has been tremendous, and I just want to tell everybody back there how much I appreciate everything, and, and if I could, I'd give each, each and every one a hug, and, and if I'm there, please don't, and you see me, don't be afraid to come up and give me a hug. I can always use them. <laughs> Steve Olin was 27. He is survived by his wife, a daughter who turned three last Sunday, and infant twins. The idea was not to try to get headlines. The idea was to try to make an impact. Just 10 months after being virtually forced to reveal publicly that he had the AIDS virus, Arthur Ashe has lost the battle with the disease. Saturday afternoon in a New York hospital, he passed away from pneumonia, a complication of AIDS. You know, the depth of the man, I guess. I've never met a person or been in a person's presence, I guess, who was, who accomplished as much, who, who was just who just had so much integrity, who was, um, who was committed, who was committed to the cause. He was a man that, who just happened to be a great tennis player. He was a great human being, a humanitarian. The story wasn't his passing, the story was his 40 some odd years and understanding uh, how we were cheated out of another 40. I saw a defense I didn't even recognize this weekend. I'm telling you, here is Pittsburgh playing UCLA, and look at the defense right here. Look at that defense. It's the diversionary shoeless zone. Thank I you, remember Ryan. watching that, uh, hey, different coiffure. <laughs> hey, I was a little bit younger there, wasn't I? But I didn't know you were going to show that. I should tell the people I brought the tape, though. I didn't know you were going to show, but I do carry the tape with me every once in a while. This is a tough one for all of us here at ESPN. The death of our friend and colleague, Jim Valvano. Jimmy Valvano cared about his players. He cared about people, and he would do anything to help you. I don't think a lot of people realize what a special person he was. And when I mean special, I'm talking once in a lifetime. Jim Valvano's courageous battle ended Wednesday morning. Three months ago, when Jim Valvano made his last trip up to our ESPN studios, he jokingly asked me how SportsCenter was going to cover his death. He made two requests put his picture over my shoulder and make sure it's a good one, and make sure people have fun. And that screen is flashing up there 30 seconds like I care about that screen right now, huh? I got, I got, I got tumors all over my body. I'm worried about some guy in the back going 30 seconds, huh? You got a lot, hey, phenomenal, buddy, you got a lot. Cancer can take away all my physical abilities. It cannot touch my mind, it cannot touch my heart, and it cannot touch my soul. And those three things are gonna carry on forever. I thank you, and God bless you all.
For Carlton Fisk, it was a wonderful night in what's been a season of discontent. The 45-year-old future Hall of Famer backstop was honored at Comiskey on the evening he was to break the Major League record for games caught. I hope this isn't viewed upon as being the end. I think this is part of the journey. It's not a destination, but part of the journey. The show is just starting, though. Bo Jackson riding in on the motorcycle that was given to Pudge from his teammates. Last Tuesday, the Chicago White Sox gave him a motorcycle and a baseball made out of crystal and a night in his honor, and today they gave Carlton Fisk one more thing, his unconditional release. Roughly three months shy of 24 years since he caught his first major league game, just six days since he broke the record for the most games caught, the Sox let the other shoe drop this afternoon, and Fisk went with it. It's not a stat he'd want to write home to mother about, but it is, in the context of baseball history, remarkable. Never mind DiMaggio's streak or Vandermeer's back-to-back no-hitters. Anthony Young of the Mets was going for real history here. Top of the six with two outs. Bases loaded. The little bloop shot by Tom Pagnasi. If you've won 23 in a row, they don't get that hit. If you lost 23 in a row, the bloopers seem to fall in. And then the pitcher, Joe McGrain, reaches out with a single. Cards lead it five to two. Say it ain't so. Anthony, only the good die young. You got to be a pretty good pitcher to be in there enough to lose 24 straight games. You don't ever go into a night saying tonight's going to be a no hitter. And I was watching the game before we went on the air, and I, you can just tell. You can tell when a guy is on. Looking for a piece of history, we take you to the ninth as promised. Two one pitch, ground ball over the middle, charged by Vizquel, bare hands. If there ever was a pitcher due for a good outing, it was Jim Abbott. The Yankees hurler brought into the game against the Indians an ERA of seven over his last three starts. All alone in the nine. Two outs, one to go. But Carlos Bayerga. Bayerga. The grounder to Randy Velarde, and this one was easy. Yup, Jim Abbott, the no-hitter at Yankee Stadium. Everyone going nuts. Is there anyone not rooting for Mr. Abbott? You know, today I, I just, I was really thinking about the win. I really was because, you know, no hitters can come and go and, and they'd be very, very nice. But, um, you know, I'd like to get to, to the playoffs. Well, that just about does it. The night lights of this past year are just ahead. I sure hope you enjoyed this look back on 1993. And of course, we can't forget 94 is just around the corner. And there will certainly be new records, events, and championships to report on in the coming weeks and months. So, on behalf of the entire ESPN Sports Center team, I'm Robin Roberts for the best of Sports Center. See you next year. For the highlights. Oh, yes! The catches. Fly ball to left center field. And Ben Sheldon was there. The ball was deflected and caught by Al Martin. <laughs> Any real stinkers? You see them there, too. Jose, you've hit a lot of home runs, you did a lot of great things, but that shot will live forever.